Good morning. morning. That was almost perfect timing. All right, so I was 19 years old, and I did the thing that you do when you're 19 years old, which is that you drop out of school, and you go join a band and live with those guys. We've all done that, right? Yeah, so I did that when I was 19, and we, we had this idea. It was a bunch of friends of mine from high school. Uh, we had this idea that we would uh, move to Minneapolis, and we would live in a house together. We would play music every day. We would make a lot of rice and beans, and we would watch a lot of cooking shows. And so we did that, and it was a, a total blast. It was completely awesome. But I think back to that time of my life, and maybe if you are beyond that time in your life, uh, you can think back to that as well. I, I sometimes laugh about just the cost of things, you know, like... Rent for me, my portion was $275 a month. How awesome is that? Now, it's a close second place to my senior year of college, which was $100 a month. Can anybody beat that? One person right there. I love it. That's awesome. We should talk after, figure out how much that was. Um, So $275 a month was, was rent. And then everything else in my life was also $275. So you do some quick math. My monthly cost was $550 a month. And so each one of us in the band had to go and get a job, some, some lavish job to support this lifestyle. And so I went to Caribou Coffee, the infamous Caribou Coffee, which I think no longer exists in this area. Is that right? Boo, Caribou, what are you doing? So you have to go up to the Twin Cities to get it. But I went there. I, there was a Caribou Coffee in Brookfield that I had spent a lot of time at uh, in high school. Some of you are nodding because you know that you saw me there. Uh, But yeah, I went for the interview. I'm very familiar with Caribou Coffee, and so I was like, this is going to be easy. I just need to communicate that I have a good work ethic, that I know what I'm talking about, and I will get this job. And so I went into the shop, and I met um, the manager, and we talked. And have you ever been in an interview where it switches from interview to training pretty quickly? Yeah, some of you are nodding, like, because you you just kind of, like, it's very obvious very quickly, like, yes, this person is going to be a great fit, and so we just, here's the handbook, let's start going through it, let's start showing you some of this stuff. So the guy ends the interview by saying these words, and I kid you not, he, he shakes my hands and he says, I have never felt so confident about somebody in my life. That's what he said to me. And I was 19 years old, and I was like, wow, you've never felt so confident about someone in your life. So I go home to the band members that I live with. I'm like, you guys, the manager said that he's never felt so confident about someone in his life. How incredible is that? So the first shift comes around, and it's a 5 a.m. shift, right? Pretty normal coffee shop hour shift. So Wednesday night, I'm getting ready. I'm laying out all my clothes. I put uh, the alarm on, and I go to bed really early. I'm like, I'm going to show up. It's going to be a great day of work. Well, the next thing that I remember, it's 6 a.m. on Thursday morning, and so I call the shop, and the manager is on the other line. Of course, he's just disappointed. He's kind of just got this really sorrowful tone to his voice, but he decides, he's like, I will give you a second chance. If you come in and show up right now, you can, you can, we'll just forget this happened. We'll just move on from here. I just remember stopping for a couple seconds. It's like one of those moments I'll always remember. I just go, maybe it's a sign. Yeah, maybe it's a sign. And that was it. And then that was the end of the conversation. I hung up the phone, and I never worked at Caribou. It was just like, yeah, my, my friends, <laughs> my friends still, still joke with me about that sometimes. They'll, they'll even say, like, yeah, maybe it's a sign. And then that's it. And uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, I'm wondering, you know, this was a situation where this guy had put at least some time and effort into me. He had these, like, good really good feelings about me as a person. He, he already started training me a little bit. Um, and so I had this short amount of time with this manager who took me through all this stuff. Uh, but the reality was, was that my human weakness, right? I mean, I just could not wake up early enough is really what it came down to. Uh, my, my human weakness took over pretty quickly. And then something that really could have been a great job never materialized. And so what I'm wondering for you is that, have you ever been there with something? Now, sometimes this can be a good thing. Sometimes you get into something new. It could be a new job. It could be something else. But pretty quickly, you start realizing, like, this is not for me. And so it doesn't materialize. And that's actually a good thing. But I would say more often than not, what happens in our life is that we want 
to take advantage of an opportunity. We, we want to get involved in something that's going to ask us to persevere. It's going to ask us to show up. It's going to ask us to do something difficult, and we just can't stick with it, and so it never materializes. And so our habits never change. Right? Our mindset stays the same. We never experience the power that happens when you stick with something, the change that can happen in your life. And so it could be like a doctor's visit, right? It's that, that thing that your spouse keeps reminding you, you should really go get that checked out. But you're worried about the change that might happen if you have to do that and, and what your lifestyle might look like if you go and see the doctor. Um, it could be that thing at work, like that, that personal uh, development thing that's not really required, but you know if you did it, you, you'd be a lot better off. You'd be a different person. But it's not required, so you just never really get around to doing it. Or how about this? It could be like a fitness or a diet regimen, right? Where week one, you start doing it. And then week two and weeks three come along, and you're like, I just don't want to stick with it. You know, it just, just doesn't have the power over me. And so I wonder if for any of us this morning, this is not only how we are with those things in our life, but if this is sometimes how we are with our faith as well. Like, I wonder if our faith ever just becomes a list of spiritual to-dos. Like, I, like I've got to pray. Like, I, I have to. I, I really I should get up early and pray. Or I really should get up and, and read my Bible. Or I, I really, I guess I have to help that person because I'm a Christian. Right? Like, I wonder if that ever happens with, with our own lives, with our spiritual lives. And I wonder if for many of us, because of the culture that we're in, you know, the culture just doesn't make it any easier to follow Jesus, does it? It's actually, you have to be pretty intentional if you want to follow Jesus. So it's really easy just to simply turn on your life onto autopilot and drift along with the culture until before you know it, you kind of look at yourself and you're just the same as everyone else. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, uh, but this morning, we're going to focus in on 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So I invite you to uh, open up your Bibles if, if you've got them. Uh, we're going to focus in on a church that was going through some interesting dynamics um, similar to this. They were present in Paul's day in the first century, where in the first century, being a Christian was not easy. Right? Being a Christian was at the very least a very strange thing to do. You believed in this Jewish teacher who died, and now his followers say that he actually came back to life. That is a strange thing to believe at any moment, but it's a, especially a strange thing to believe in the first century. But at the very most, you're actually putting your life at risk. So it's, it, you're at least strange, but you might actually be putting your life at risk as well. So this is the cultural dynamic at play in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians, and it's a little different from many of Paul's other letters. So a lot of Paul's other letters, he opens it up, he does some greetings, some welcomes, welcome, and then he gets into what he wants to talk about. In 1 Thessalonians, he'll actually spend three chapters just doing like an intro welcoming section. So we're just coming to the end of that today, right at the end of chapter 3. And so to situate ourselves with what's going on, we can read Acts chapter 17. It describes Paul's very brief time that he had in the city of Thessalonica. So in Acts 17, it talks about Paul spending three Sabbaths there. Now think about the amount of time Paul spent in some other cities. He actually spent years in some of the other places he, he was at. But here in Thessalonica, he only had three weeks with these people. Three weeks to teach them. In other words, Paul planted a church of people who were, who were sec, um, they were in a secular culture, with an array of religious options to choose from. He spoke to Jewish people. He spoke to non-Jewish people in this culture. He planted this church, had three weeks, and then he had to go. He had to leave. And he only had three weeks because some of the Jewish leaders in the town were getting jealous that he was gathering a following. And so, so they formed a mob to get him out of the city. All right, now just think of how ridiculous and crazy that is. In our culture, we don't see mobs being formed all that often, do we? They formed a mob because of the things that he was saying about Jesus, because he was, he was preaching this message not just about a Jewish guy who came and preached some nice things, but this, this man named Jesus who came and preached and healed and died and was resurrected. I mean, this was scandalous. This, this was worth forming a mob over to get him out of the city. 
And Paul was using their own Jewish texts, their own Old Testament, to prove these things. I mean, there, there's a reason why they had this vitriolic response to what he was saying. And so after three weeks, they said, enough is enough, and they rushed him out of the city. And so Paul was forced to escape by night. He was forced to leave the city with these very, very young believers in his wake. You know, he probably would have loved to stay longer, but he just couldn't. And so now imagine, put yourself in Paul's situation. Imagine, how would you feel about these people, about this church that you had just left in this place? They must seem like infants to you. They don't know anything. Like, they just barely had any time to discover anything. And you'd be wondering, you'd be wondering, how are they doing? They didn't even have any written gospel accounts, probably. They probably just had stories about Jesus that were passed on to them. Do you guys ever pick up the Bible and realize how lucky you are? Especially with the Gospels, right? You can just read all of these stories about Jesus anytime you want. Four different Gospel accounts that we have. And this church probably didn't have any written Gospel accounts. Just think about that. It's amazing. And so Paul is sitting now, probably in Athens, and he's thinking about them, and he's wondering, how are they doing? How are they doing? Uh, parents, uh, any of you who are parents who have had kids who have grown up, gone through high school, and then you send them off to college, I haven't had that experience yet, but you've probably had that experience as well, where you think about the 18 years you had to train these kids, right? And now you're going to send them out into the world, and 18 years probably doesn't feel like enough time. You're like, I wish I had more time to keep on training these kids. And yet, think about it now. Paul had three weeks. Three weeks. It's unbelievable. So at the beginning of chapter 3, we see Paul struggling so much. He says this. He says, when we could stand it no longer, we sent Timothy. He's just sitting there in turmoil within himself. When, when I could stand it no longer, I'm just, I just have to send Timothy to find out how this church is doing. He sent somebody that he trusted to find out how they were doing and Paul's expectation, in fact, what he told them is you're going to be persecuted. And in fact, he's even wondering at the beginning of chapter 3, it says he's wondering if the tempter had tempted them to stop following anymore. In fact, in, in some ways, he was expecting this to happen. And so he's wondering how are they doing. And so with that, let's pick up at verse 6. It says this, it says, But Timothy has now just come back to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. You know, it reminds me uh, of myself when I was in high school and I had so many um, leaders at the church that I grew up in and small group leaders and people talk about the importance in my life of when you go to college, Nate, make sure that on day one, on week one, you are getting connected to other believers at the university that I went to. You know, don't wait, don't wait till week two, because by the time week two comes around, you've already started doing other things. But right away with week one, make sure you get involved. So myself and my roommate who I grew up with, who was also a Christian, on day number one, I remember we got into our dorm and right out behind our dorm, Navigators was holding a worship night where they had a bunch of food and we were just worshiping and get to know people. And so the very first day of college for me was spent in this group of new believers. You know, this was a new community. There was this infrastructure that was already built in to campus life. And that was amazing that there was this infrastructure that was already there. Because that's the culture that we have today in America. So for as imperfect as our culture is, one of the beautiful things is that we can meet with each other and that we have freedom to be with other believers. And so I, that's a huge benefit to us. But now think about this church in the first century. There was no worship gathering they could like just go outside behind where they lived and participate with. They couldn't walk down the street to some other teacher and find out more information about Jesus. Right? In, in so many ways, they were very alone. It was just them. Paul had come and he had preached and he had left so quickly. And they were left behind in this culture that did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. 
And so Timothy comes back, and just think of how you would feel if you were Paul. He brings good news. Now catch it. That, that word should like ring a bell. If you've been around church for a while, good news. This is literally the same word that we get for gospel. So all those other times in the New Testament when we hear about the gospel, Jesus went and preached the gospel. Well, here the gospel came back to Paul. Now, Paul had been preaching the gospel, but now the gospel is coming back to him. The good news, which, which tells you that that term gospel has a broader usage. It's not just about the message of Jesus, that that is the good news. I mean, that is what we talk about at church most of the time. But the good news was actually a story coming back to him about this community's faithfulness. And so this is the first point for this morning. It's an encouragement to the young believers. Uh, one thing I love about Meadowbrook is that we actually have quite a few young believers, well, however you want to define that. But you guys are all different ages. You know, it's not like all the young believers are young people. Like, we have young believers of all different ages, just as we have mature believers who are of all different ages. And that's a beautiful thing. So for our first point this morning, for the young believers, um, the faith that you have— your ability to stick with Jesus through the hard things of this culture and this world is refreshing. The faith of young believers is refreshing. It is good news to the mature. And it's because of this good news that Paul goes on. He says this in verse 7. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, uh, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. You know, it's one thing to be a parent, to hear a good report back from your kid at college that they're doing well, but it's another thing altogether to be nearly killed by a mob, to have to flee in the night, to have to leave this group of young Christians in a culture view that viewed the message of a re resurrected Jesus as ridiculous. So hearing that a group like that was faithful was like the most encouraging thing that could possibly happen for Paul. And so here's what I want to say to those of you who view yourselves as young in the faith. Your simple willingness to live faithfully in the middle of hard situations can actually be the lifeline for all of the rest of us who are around you and watching how are you going to do. We encourage each other in that way. We, we watch each other. I mean, we don't like to talk about that very much, but we're actually paying attention. Like, who's around me? Are they following Jesus? Are they staying faithful to Jesus? You know, the past seven or eight years, and even maybe a little longer than that, in our culture, uh, in a lot of evangelical Christianity, we've gone through this whole moment of time where we just have been questioning things deeper and deeper. We've been wanting to get to what is the actual truth of my faith, of science, of life. We've been in this kind of questioning phase as a culture uh, for the better part of seven to ten years. While some of that questioning has had like ill motives, I have to say most of it has had really good motives. It's people who really want to discover, myself included, who want to just ask the toughest questions possible, who want deep answers. And many of us in this room right now, you guys know you've had a, a moment in your life, maybe it's recently, maybe it was decades ago though, where you went through times of deep questioning and deep testing to get honest answers about the validity of your faith, and that is a good, good thing. But part of the result of this cultural movement where we've been questioning so much is that some of my friends have chosen, I'm just not going to follow Jesus anymore. I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. And as a person who's been asking these tough questions but continues to follow Jesus, I've had moments in my life over the years where I can sometimes feel alone. I don't know if you've ever experienced that within your own faith as well, where you look around, you're wondering, like, is, is that person going to stop following Jesus, or is that person going to stop? And I've got to say, one of the most impactful things you can, can do um, as a follower of Jesus in moments like this, it sounds really simple, but just keep following him. You don't have to understand everything today. In fact, you'll never understand everything but just to say, I'm going to learn how to trust you. I'm going to, I'm going to learn to ask tough, tough questions. I'm going to learn to engage truth. And I'm going to learn how to keep following you even when I don't have all of the answers. Uh, an example of this that happened for me a long time ago when I was a freshman in college, actually. I, I was, was watching YouTube uh, one time, and there was this video that came on 
uh, about the fact that Jesus was not the only Messiah, right? This is like a challenging video, but that he was one of many people who claimed to be the Messiah. And at that time, I remember nobody at my church had ever told me that growing up. Because it was true, many people claimed to be the Messiah, but the way that this video framed it was to say, well, Jesus was no one special. You know, there was nothing really different about Jesus. Of course, there was so much different about Jesus that the video ignored, but I remember feeling very threatened in my faith at the time. Like, what am I going to do with this new information? And I remember praying to God, and it was with time that the answers started to come to this question of like, okay, well, what about this challenging thing in my life? But I had to slow down the pace of my thinking. And so here's my advice this morning, is to breathe. Just breathe. Just know that at any moment, you are only seeing just one little sliver of the whole picture. And to slow down, to go and to pursue truth and to pursue God, but to slow down the process and say, I want to discover what's true, and I'm going to slow down and allow God to work and to speak into my life. And you know, when we're reading about this community in Thessalonica that was dealing with this very real threat of persecution, and now they had to figure out, am I going to keep following him? Um, they were so limited in their information about Jesus, weren't they? They knew so much less than we do about who Jesus is. They didn't know everything about him. They didn't have all the answers, and they had a thousand reasons to stop following him. And yet they knew that he was real. They knew that he was real. They had three weeks with Paul, and it was long enough to know that Jesus was real. And here comes this message that they're standing firm. They're standing firm. And friends, as you and I do the same thing, we simply continue to follow him day by day, to simply breathe, to say that this new information seems challenging, but I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust that if I simply faithfully keep following you and seeking you, that things will become more clear. And as we do that, we'll experience those around us who are going to see us doing that, and they're going to be so encouraged by that. And so that's what happened with Paul. So he says this in verse 8. He says, For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. You see, I, I bet you didn't realize just to what extent your simple consistency to keep following Jesus impacts the rest of us. I love this phrase. It's one of my favorite little, little lines from Paul where he says, Now we really live. It's just such a really cool way of putting it. Because it implies that there are ways to live, but not be truly or fully living. And he, and he gets this report back about these other people, what they're doing. And he's saying, now we truly live. Another way that it can be translated, uh, sometimes it's translated for now, we can breathe again. Another translation is, it is the breath of life to us. Now, whenever you hear uh, language in the Bible about breath— or about um, wind, it's actually talking about the Spirit of God usually, right? That's what, where the term spirit comes from. It's from. It actually has this idea of breath, that the breath, the thing that fills up our lungs, is the Spirit of God. And so these are words for how the Spirit moves in a person. And so this is just another way in which our faithfulness, think about this, the ability of the Spirit of God to flow through us can be strengthened by other people around us who are faithfully following Jesus. I just find that amazing. This is another way that your faithfulness is breathing life into the people around you. And that breath of life results in something. It results in joy. So this is what Paul says in verses 9 and 10. He says, How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Uh, now, if it's, if it's true that up until now we had a window into the impact of young believers on older believers, this is now where we get a window into what older believers, how they impact other believers as well. Paul is painting a picture of what his, him and his companions' lives look like. It's one where he has experiences in the presence of God. He says that they pray day 
and night. All right, so you know, um, a few chapters later in this letter, Paul is going to say something that I always found really funny, especially as a kid growing up in church, because it was quoted a lot. Um, He'll say that we are supposed to pray continually. Uh, Did any of you guys hear that in church growing up? Like, pray continually. Yes, and you're like, and you're like, he must be hyperbolic here. He must, must be like saying something that he doesn't actually mean because nobody can pray continually. Or you think like, oh, it would be really nice to have that much free time so that I could pray continually. That would be great. Yes, Paul, please give me the money that I need so that I can pray continually. Um, And yet this is actually not the first time that Paul has told us to do something day and night in this letter. So if you just go back one chapter to chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says, we worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. And so you should be asking the question like, okay, so Paul, were you working night and day? Or were you praying night and day? And Paul would, he would just nod. He'd be like, yes, yes, I was doing both. Which should redefine our concept of how the life of a Christian, whether you're young or old, works. And as you get older, it should become more and more like this. It should redefine our concept of prayer. It's not just the act of closing your eyes and being quiet. Paul actually talks about it as a place where his spirit lives. He, I mean, he says, what are we going to do with all the joy that we have in the presence of God? And it's like, well, Paul, you're not in the presence of God. You're in Athens. And he's like, well, it's possible to be in two places at once because of what prayer is. Paul says that he's in the presence of God. He talks about that joy because of these new believers, and he says, do it day and night. Pray day and night. It simply means that everything that's happening in Paul's life is coming through the filter, and it's going up to God. So the hard things in his life, or the easy things, the good things in his life, Paul is bringing them into the presence of God. So this ability to pray in diverse moments of your life is actually a spiritual practice. Again, going back to that kind of perseverance thing from the beginning of doing something over and over in the same ways that we want to see results in our life. If you want to see real results in your life of joy, peace, love, all of the things that that Jesus exemplifies, become a person of prayer. Learn how to spend time in prayer. And so in the same way that the faith of young believers is refreshing, to the mature, that's a refreshing thing to see. The prayers of the mature provide strength to the young believers. And so I hope you're starting to get a glimpse of this picture of what life between Christian brothers and sisters looks like. Whether you've been following Jesus for decades or you've just begun, I want you to know that you are necessary. You should know that we need you. If you've been following Jesus for a year and you feel inadequate around these people who have been following Jesus for decades, it's not true. You're not inadequate. We actually need you. We need your voice. We need your presence. We need your prayers. We need your energy. We need your passion for God. Uh, We as a community are better off because each and every one of you is here this morning. You individually matter a great deal. And so the picture I just want us to catch this morning of what a life in pursuit of Jesus looks like, it's new believers and mature believers, each going to God consistently and finding our joy in him, finding our life in him, and then living it out in the midst of a world that really doesn't care about him or they think they don't care about him. And as we do this, our example of life our act of prayer on behalf of each other and for the world, it mutually should encourage each other and fill us up with love and joy. And that's how Paul ends this. He he ends it, let's read verses 7 through 13. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father. 
when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And when I read language like this, this is like kind of classic benediction type language, and your, your brain can kind of just go on autopilot sometimes when you read stuff like this. But, but let's look at just these two words, blameless and holy, because those are big churchy words. Those, those are words we usually just associate with church. And, and you might be thinking, well, Paul wants my heart to be strengthened so that I can be blameless and holy, and how in the world am I supposed to do that? And the answer is that you can't. And, and yeah, there we go. And, and I can't. Some of you have known me since I was a toddler, and you know that I can't do it. And neither can you. And, and let me be clear. You can't do it on your own strength. I can't do it on my own strength. Because that word holy means to be different. It means to be set apart that you're something different. And I got to say, us as humans, we are not different. We actually look at each other a lot, and we mimic each other a lot. And so the same thing was happening in the church in Thessalonica. They were in this culture that had nothing to do with Jesus. And in a lot of ways, our culture has nothing to do with, with the real Jesus either. And that's why Paul was praying for them. You see, he couldn't go and be with them. But if they were praying and he was praying, they could actually be in the same place even though they were miles apart in the presence of God with one another. And he's doing this, he's saying this so that it could change their heart. And the, the word heart means these things. It means thoughts, your, des your desires, your passions, your appetites, your affections, your purposes, your endeavors. It, it's the whole part of you, who you actually are. God wants to change your heart. And, and left to our own devices, we will just drift. But together, as mature and as growing Christians, as a body together, something starts to happen. Something happens when young and old believers come together. Seasoned Christians and, and new Christians come together. We refresh each other. We provide strength to one another. We pray on behalf of each other, and we start to look holy and blameless, and it starts to change our hearts. And the good news is that that's actually what all of us want in the first place. You know, sometimes we think that's not what we want. I've got a friend who um, grew up as a Christian, was a passionate follower of Jesus, and then he went off on his own way for quite a, a long time, many decades actually. And, and just recently we've been talking, and he, and he came back and said, I'm starting to realize that what I actually want is Jesus. I thought that for all these years what I wanted was what I wanted. But he started to see his appetites, his passions, his desires, all these things taking over his life, and he, and he realized what I actually want, as weird as it sounds, is to be holy, is to be different. And so here's our big idea, church, this is so important for all of us, is to form a community that, where this can continue to happen. It's that perseverance under pressure is powerful. Your ability to persevere under pressure is so powerful and we're looking at each other and wondering if it's going to happen. And so how do we do this? Just a few things, a few words of advice for how we can do this. I'm going to give you three things and then a bonus thing. One is to remain with Jesus. In John 6, Jesus preaches a hard passage, a hard thing. Everyone leaves him, and he looks at his disciples and says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of life. Learn to remain with Jesus even when it's hard. The second way we do this is by staying connected. You know, this, this church in Thessalonica was connected to Paul. It was connected to Silas and to, to Timothy. But they needed to stay connected within their own fellowship as well. Are you connected to other believers who are at distinctly different stages of the journey than you? If you've been following Jesus for many, many decades, do you, are you friends with people who are just starting? 
Or how about the other way? If you're a new believer, do you have friends who are in the 40 plus club who have been following Jesus for many, many, many decades? Um, we need each other. We need to stay connected. The third way is by speaking our needs to one another, and this is one that I, I find really important to me. In the church, we so often pretend like everything is fine. My life is fine. I don't struggle with anything. Everything's great in my life, which means that I have nothing to pray for you about, and I, can't, I also feel isolated because my life is not fine, and I have all kinds of problems. And the real reality friends, is look around. These are all, is a room full of people with problems, and we all need to come with each other before Jesus and bring those things to him so that he can deal with them. So, so be honest. Speak, speak your needs to one another. And then the last thing, the bonus thing, is to actually pray. I know that in this congregation we have so many prayer warriors, uh, but what I should want to say is this, just that if you haven't developed that muscle of prayer in your life, the power of praying for people is the most powerful thing you'll ever do in your life. And the, the ability to pray for people out loud with them, instead of saying, I'll pray for you, just say, can I pray for you right now? That power will strengthen each other so much. And so, friends, let's do that. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love you so much. We think about this church in Thessalonica, uh, the way that they were under pressure and that they figured out a way to persevere. It gives us strength even today. And so, Lord, I'm, I'm praying that you would give us eyes to see the people around us. You uh, give us ways in which we can stay connected to you, in which we can connect with them even more so that things can change in our life, Lord, so that we can see you more clearly. I pray for um, those who are here this morning who might have big questions about faith, and, and really what they need is some persevering people around them to come alongside them, to be there for them. I pray for them, Lord, right where they're at in their journey, that they might take those next steps of knowing you and trusting you. And Lord, I pray for the, the more mature believers who have been following you for decades and decades, and we just want to say thank you, God, for your faithfulness. God, we pray for them that they would be strengthened this morning, encouraged, that they'd go out of this place with a refreshed sense of who you are and a desire to follow you more and more. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.